The Imperial Council Part 3. Not all Mehmed II's and Bayezid II's appointments followed this. Pattern. Other viziers of non-Muslim origin, such as the Albanian, Daoud Pasha, Grand Vizier between 1485 and 1497, probably came into the Sultan's service through the collection rather than through voluntary conversion. Iskander Pasha, who was vizier between 1489 and 1496, was the son of a Genoese father and a Greek mother from Trabzon. 22 A few viziers of this era were still of Muslim Turkish descent. Chandarli Ibrahim is the most obvious example, but Mehmed Pasha, who was vizier late in Mehmed II's reign and again between 1483 and 1485 was also a member of a powerful Turkish family. His grandfather, Yorguç, and his father, Hizir, had been tutors in Amasya to the future sultans Murad II and Bayezid II respectively. Hiri, Mehmed Pasha, 23 Grand Vizier between 1518 and 1523 was also a Muslim Turk. Nonetheless, a striking feature of the era between the Accession of Mehmed II and the accession of Suleiman I is the number of viziers of noble Christian descent. By appointing these men to the highest positions in the government, the sultans were assimilating members of the former ruling families of the Balkan Peninsula into the Ottoman elite. This system of assimilation also allowed the sultans to exploit their family connections for political ends and, as the unhappy fates of Mahmud Pasha and Dukagin Zayd Ahmed exemplify, to bring the pre-Ottoman ruling caste firmly under the sultans' control. By the accession of Suleiman I in 1521, this process was complete, and no more viziers emerged from this background. It seems that, most of the viziers after 1521 were from the western part of the Balkan Peninsula, although there were exceptions. Ozdemiraghu Osman Pasha, 24 Grand Vizier in 1584-5, was a Turk, and Jigalizade Shinan, briefly Grand Vizier in 1596, was a Genoese, Shipyane Sakala, whom, the Admiral, Piala Pasha, had taken captive in 1560 and presented to the Sultan. The 16th century viziers were not, however, descendants of ruling dynasties, but rather the offspring of peasants. Typically, they had come to the palace as lads whom the Sultan had levied from his own Christian subjects, through the collection. In the palace, they had studied in the great and small chambers in the third court and then, after progressing through the ranks of the pages and holding an office within the palace, the Sultan appointed them to a provincial governorship. From the provinces, if they had the ruler's favor, they could return to the second court as viziers of the imperial council. Lutfi Pasha, Grand Vizier between 1539 and 1541, gave an account of his own career. He was, by origin, an Albanian, and came to the palace, one may presume, through the collection. These details he omits, beginning his autobiography in the palace. From the time of the late Sultan Bayezid Khan, whose abode is in paradise. I, this humble being, was brought up in the Sultan's private apartments, through the bounty of the Sultan, as a well-wisher of the Ottoman port. When I was in the private apartments, I studied many kinds of science. At the accession of His Excellency Salim Khan, I graduated from the post of cloth-bearer, to become a mute ferika with fifty akshas, per day. Then I was head-taster, then head-gatekeeper and then master of the standard. Afterwards, I became governor of Kastamanu and governor-general of Karaman. Then the vizierate was bestowed on me. The career of one of Lutfi Pasha's immediate successors, Rustam. Pasha, 25 was similar. He seems to have been a Bosnian by birth, who entered the palace through the collection. Within the palace, he became the sultan's weapons bearer in the privy chamber, and then master of the stables. When he left the palace, he became first governor general of Diyarbakir and then of Anatolia. He next joined the imperial council as third vizier. By 1541, he was second vizier, and grand vizier by 1544. Like Lutfi Pasha, he also married into the imperial family. What most struck foreigners about this succession of viziers who had originally come to the palace as lads from the collection, was the contrast between their wealth and exalted position and the humble estate of their original families. It is to emphasize this difference that Antoine Geoffroy gives a description, perhaps apocryphal, of the father of Ibrahim Pasha, Grand Vizier from 1523 to 1536. He begins, with a depiction of Ibrahim, from Parga in Albania. Who because, he had grown up young in the palace with the said Grand Turk, achieved such credit and authority that he commanded absolutely, and disposed of everything, without the Grand Turk interfering in Apos. This, contrasts with Ibrahim's father, a man of nothing, useless, a frequenter of taverns, a drunkard sleeping in the streets like the beasts in Apos. This systematic use of the collection to promote men of humble, 
origin to the vizirate, a practice which this story symbolizes, is a measure of the increasing power of the sultan. Although members of local dynasties continued to receive appointments in the provinces, sultans no longer felt constrained to appoint them to membership of the imperial council. Instead they preferred men who were members of the imperial household and had no links to patronage and authority outside the palace. Ibrahim Pasha is again a good example of the powers which the sultan could exercise. Suleiman I, against all precedent, appointed Ibrahim from the privy chamber directly to the Grand Vizierate, with no previous experience of government, having thus raised him from nothing to the highest office, thirteen years. Later, during the Baghdad campaign, he executed him, by choosing them from among the slaves raised in his own household. The Sultan was able, if he wished, to exercise absolute power over his viziers. In the troubled years from the end of the 16th century, however, it seems to have been as much the influence of rival factions, both within the palace and outside, that created or broke viziers. The office of Grand Vizier became especially precarious, one factor in this, being the prolonged wars of the period. If the Grand Vizier was not also the commander of a campaign, he had to surrender many of his powers of appointment and revenue raising to the commander of the army. On the other hand, if he himself became commander, his absence from Istanbul and the relinquishing of his place on the imperial council to a deputy exposed him to the plots of political rivals. 26. This dilemma, which arose from the lack of distinction between political and military authority, undoubtedly played a part in the rapid succession of grand viziers between 1590 and 1656. Nonetheless, it remained the rule that viziers should, in their origins, be non-Muslim or, at least non-Turkish. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, most grand viziers, for example, Koja, the elder, Shinan Pasha or Yemishchi, the fruiterer, Hassan Pasha, were Albanian. Towards the mid-century, however, Caucasians, Circassians, Abkhazians and Georgians, began to compete with them for office. The first Caucasian Grand Vizier was Mehmed Pasha, the Georgian in 1622-3. The appointment of Mehmed Pasha the Circassian followed in 1624. Melek Ahmed Pasha, who first assumed the Grand Vizierate in 1650, was Abkhazian, as were his successors, Siavush Pasha in 1651, and Ibishir Mustafa in 1654-527. The same, troubled period also saw the appointment of a Georgian in 1651 and a Circassian in 1653. In the end, it could be said that the Albanian faction won in the struggle for office. In 1656, Mehmed IV's mother, Turin Sultan, appointed the Albanian Kuprulu Mehmed as Grand Vizier. His son, Fazil Ahmed Pasha inherited the office and held it, until his death in 1676. If, from the mid-15th century, it was very rare for a Turkish Muslim to become a vizier, this was not the case for the other offices of the Imperial Council. Before the 16th century, the posts of vizier and military judge were not, as the careers of the two Chandarli Ibrahim show, mutually exclusive, a military judge could become a vizier, if not vice versa. In the 16th century, however, a new pattern emerged. From this time, military judgeships, and indeed all senior judicial appointments became the preserve of a few fiercely competing learned families. When a member of one of these clans achieved high office, he would use his influence and powers of patronage to advance his kinsmen. An example in the 16th century is the Shivazade family, the descendants of a professor, a certain Shivazade Ilyas. Ilyas's son, Mahiedin rose to become military judge of Anatolia in 1537. His son, Mehmed, achieved the same position in 1575. Two years later, he was military judge of Romelia. In 1598, Mehmed III made his and his father's teacher, Saadadin, chief, Mufti. In 1601, Saadadin's son, Mehmed Assad, was military judge of Anatolia, while his brother had succeeded their father in the Muftiship. 28 The post of military judge was therefore, unlike the Vizirate, open to Muslim Turks but only to those from a very restricted circle. It was not open to the mass of judges who held posts in the small towns of the empire, the chancellors and treasurers on the imperial council, again, from the early 16th century, also came to form a group whose background was different from that of the viziers. Before 1520, the council was perhaps more fluid. Mehmed II's last grand vizier, Nishanji, the chancellor, Mehmed Pasha had risen to the post from the chancellorship. Salim I was to elevate the treasurer of Romelia, Piri Mehmed Pasha, to the post of third and finally, in 1518, Grand Vizier. After this date, there seemed to have been no promotions from Chancellor or Treasurer directly to the Vizierate, although from the 
1570s, appointments of treasurers to provincial governorships were not uncommon. 29 The father of the Chancellor, Okshu's aide, moved from the post of chief treasurer to become governor general of Cyprus in 1581.30. Like the military judges, the chancellors and treasurers seem, as a rule, to have been Muslim Turks and graduates of the religious colleges. However, the training which followed was scribal rather than legal, beginning, with appropriate patronage, as an apprentice in a great household, in the service of a provincial governor or treasurer, or in the imperial council or treasury itself. The famous Faradun Bey, 31, for example, began his career as a protege of the chief treasurer, Shivazade Abdi Chelebi, brother of the military judge, Mahiedin. It was probably in Abdi's house that he learned his craft. On Abdi's death in 1553, he entered the household of the future Grand Vizier, Sokolu Mehmed Pasha and, through Sokolu, became chief clerk to the Imperial Council in 1570. Three years later, he was chancellor. In 1576, however, presumably as a result of Murad III's dislike of Sokolu, he suffered dismissal and exile. The Sultan, however, recalled him to his post in 1581, after Sokolu's assassination.